Greetings and welcome to The Dividing Line. It is a Thursday. Tomorrow's up in the air as far as whether we'll be able to do a program or not. And I don't know what next week's going to look like at all. I have a gut feeling that next week may be... I might get to start using the beautiful music that Seb Goldswain provided for me to record these short little teaching things. Um, uh, I'm going to be away. Um, the way this year is going, um, the the road I normally train on this time of year will undoubtedly be closed. Um, just because every single ride that that I was supposed to be doing in July has been canceled due to the uh, COVID panic. And um, I mean, I mean, <laughs> uh, well, yeah, uh, I know. Um, that's my concern is that they'll close that road be because of fire concerns, wind and dryness. And I just, I'm just, I, I'm just trying to mentally prepare myself that I'm not going to be able to climb. I'm just going to have to ride at altitude. Um, anyway, um, the the greatest place in the world for you to be, of course, is outside <laughs> in the fresh air. Um, but they canceled it all, anyways, because it is. Uh, oh, by the way, I um, uh, because of uh, large increases in testing in Arizona, the they're they're pushing the story that we're all about to die of again of COVID. I don't know anybody who's buying it. No, I do. I do actually. I was, I was out and about today, and there, there, yeah, there are a lot of very panicked people, and I, I feel for them. I really do. But um, uh, so there, a lot of cities just making it now mandatory. Uh, AZ mask up is now the you know the thing. You're that's how you you uh, virtue signal is is you do that, and um, uh, so I just ordered two masks. Don't do that. Uh, I just ordered um, two masks with printing on them. And um, basically, it says something along the line. Yeah. Uh, basically, it's, it says it's a protest. And I'm, I'm really wondering, to be honest with you, if I'll even get them. Take that thing out of your ear. Um, uh, I, I, I've, I really, really wonder if the company I ordered it from won't write to me and say, oh, we're not going to print that. I mean, you could put foul oh, yeah. language and, and, and anything else on it. But something tells me, um, you know, it basically says this is an assault upon my person, my health and my freedoms. And uh, it's a useless, stupid virtue signaling. It's not that long. Uh, you can't put that much on it. Uh, unless you want to be really close to try to read it. <laughs> That's sort of, well, it doesn't have a purpose. A anyway, I'll, I'll be really, really interested to see if I actually get them. I, I, I really do. Uh, yeah, just, yeah, yeah. Um, all you gotta do is say you're protesting. Just say you're 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 protesting, and they'll let you do anything. Um, but anyway, uh, so uh, lots of um, weird stuff going on, and that's changing schedule stuff. So next week. <sighs> You know, we may we may try to do a Zoom based um, program. I just I just don't know if the internet's going to be up to it uh, where I'm going to be at. We'll see. Uh, and if not, then I will try to do some short things that we can still put something out there and and let you know we're still here. So we'll see. We'll see. I've mentioned before that my mind works in unusual ways and that. Um, Evidently, there is a review process going on all the time after I do programs, um, and that's blank again. Um, and um, so uh, at some point, maybe it's, I was listening to somebody else. I, I, I don't know. But at some point, I uh, realized that there was a element of what I had wanted to say about the Bostock decision by the Supreme Court that I forgot to say, or at least I think I forgot to say. In my mental recording does not contain uh, the discussion of this. Uh, that's because I, I generally do not have anything other than just a single line talk about such and so rather than an outline of things like that. But if you've read the decision and 
the minority responses, the dissents, there's, there's been a lot of really good discussions about the illogic of the, well, there, there was with uh, uh, the gay marriage one, too, um, Obergefell, uh, a lot of discussion about just the gaping holes in, in the logic of the majority and, and everything along those lines, and that's quite true. But I think if you just sit back for a second and you just sort of listen to the argumentation and listen to what's being said as a Christian or as any American, say, in, in the first 150 years, minimally, of the nation's existence, uh, you know, back when the Bible would be quoted by government officials and things like that, and not just used as a photo op either. Um, if you just sit back and you just sort of listen to the argumentation, it doesn't take you very long to realize that this conversation really can't get anywhere because we have come to a point in our culture where the very use of the words good and evil have been so completely redefined by our constant social pressure and our social experience that, you know, we're, we're talking about what sex is, not the verb, but the noun. And, and only one aspect of the meaning of the noun. Um, there can be no discussion on the part of anyone in the Supreme Court any longer. You know, maybe in closed chambers, maybe in their own office, but in the actual discussion, there can be no reference made to any type of objective standard in divine truth. Our society has is embarrassed that we ever once believed that. Our founding documents say it, but we're embarrassed by that. And obviously, what the Bostock decision was about was whether there is such a thing as a objective definition of what a male or a female, what a man or a woman is. But that was never discussed. That, that just doesn't come up. It's just not there. And it can't be there. Not anymore. Can, can you imagine if, if anyone actually brought that up and said, hey, let's, let's actually talk about whether there is such a thing as, as a male or female and, and whether there is any, any meaningful defense of the idea that someone can simply identify as a male or female and that, that that's going to be allowable even if it runs directly counter to all the evidence that, that exists scientifically in the objective realm. Can't talk about that. If you can't talk about that, your society has completely lost its way. It's, it's, it's lost a, its ground for being able to, to meaningfully address any of these issues. So we as Christians have to be very quick to point this out, but we also have to be very uh, compelling in how we express this. What I mean by that is the independent fundamentalist Baptist King James only way of approaching this isn't, isn't effective. We do have a clear divine revelation from God on this subject, but how do you present that to people who do not believe there can even possibly be such a thing. You don't do it by, and this is where the presuppositional apologetics issue comes in, you don't engage any of these subjects by putting the rebel sinner in the place of judge. And I'm really afraid that in a lot of the current conversation that we're having with our next door neighbor over the fence, or um, I was going to 
come up with some other places where you'd be talking with people, and then I realized you can't talk to people anymore. It's It, it all has to be online. Uh, who, who talks in person anymore? Um, I was ordering food. I actually went into one of my little places I like to go to and ordered food, and, of course, the lady is in this mask. I could not understand a word she was saying. I was just so frustrated. I mean, I, I, I sort of had to stick my head under the plexiglass. What? What? And I, I still... Okay, whatever. Just give me my food. Um, we can't have those conversations. And my concern is that even when we do, even those of us that are presuppositionalists tend to be evidentialist. In that, for me, the, the, the key issues of presuppositionalism are... It's the scriptural teaching of the absolute centrality of the existence of God for human knowledge to exist. The scriptural teaching about the nature of man as a rebel sinner who suppresses truth. Um, and the reality that what all of that means is that an apologist is damaging what he's attempting to do by encouraging a rebel sinner to pretend that he is judge over these issues. So what I'm saying is, when we talk about, for example, transgenderism, and by the way, this is directly associated with Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter is a Marxist organization, and one of its central tenets is the reality of transgenderism. That is, that is part of who they are and what they are. So every corporation that's, that's got that stuff out there and links for you to donate, by the way, most of that money ends up in the Democratic Party's coffers um, during election year. It just so happens it worked out that way. <laughs> just, just, just so happens that all the major sports and everything else are all tripping over themselves to help promote the Democratic Party in an election year. I, you want corruption? It ain't the Russians. You've got it right there. There's, there's where it is. There's, there was, there's the tampering, and it's happening right in front of all of us. And they're going to get away with it. And nothing, nothing, nothing will be done about it. I, I can just, that's just the way it is. Anyway, uh, most of the conversation that we're engaging in is inviting rebel sinners to pretend that they can actually define the key issues of what is male, what is female. These are people who are operating on the foundation of there being no creator, and yet they're people who know the creator exists. But they and the people around them, they and the people around them, this, this is something that, that feeds on itself, it's sort of a feedback loop. They and the people around them seek to live their lives without ever having to open their eyes to the reality that the day of judgment is coming. And so they encourage one another to say things and do things that deny the reality of that coming day of judgment. Romans chapter 1, they encourage others in the same way, remember? Most amazing passage, in, in, almost the most amazing passage in all the Bible, in its insight into the human condition. So the point is, how do you approach this presuppositionally? Well, you have to appeal to the fact that they will not live consistently in light of the assumptions that they are bringing to this subject of transgenderism, whether God defines our existence or not. Um, and that can be rather easily done because that is one area where we naturally recognize the goodness of fatherhood, motherhood. You have to absolutely... This is why... This is why once the left seizes power, uh, for however long that lasts, I do not believe it can last, it will last longer than it would have 100 years ago because of technology. It will be more expensive in human lives because of technology. But one thing I know, we are creating the image of God, and this system fundamentally denies that, and therefore it cannot long last. It will, it, it has no internal uh, structure to hold it together outside of the evil of man. And that, that could be pretty bad. Communism killed 120 million last, last uh, century, and it seems uh, that we are intent 
upon seeing if we can do better in in this century. Uh, better, as in more. Let, let's try for 240, maybe 250. Uh, maybe someday we'll get the idea that communism is a absolutely demonic uh, system. I understand. I, uh, Teen Vogue has an article right now. I did not. I could not bring myself to log on to Teen Vogue. In fact, I just didn't. I was just too scared to. Uh, but, but a. I saw the front page of a um, uh, article in Teen Vogue introducing people to Karl Marx, and he's just being presented as a a as a man with different um, economic ideas. <laughs> and given the state of public education, there you go. Uh, you know, I mean, the teachers believe that too. So there you go. That's, that's where we are. Um, so we can't, we can't approach this in such a fashion as we are we have to press the person about their own createdness. And if they say more than three sentences, if you're listening carefully, they will give you evidence that you can use in that way. Um, but there are all sorts of human relationships that we have, that the goodness of fatherhood, the goodness of motherhood, all these types of things that we can bring in and demonstrate their incoherence. Mm -hmm. Press, press that incoherence uh, in, that, in that situation. It's not just a matter, you know, it's funny, we recognize as presuppositionalists that we can't just simply throw theistic proofs at somebody. You know, let's go for the cosmological argument. Well, I think the cosmological argument is a valid argument in a Christian worldview. It requires the principle of sufficient reason, which comes from a Christian worldview. So it's a valid argument in a Christian worldview. In the same way, the issue of transgenderism we have the winning argument from a Christian worldview. The other side has no worldview in which to demonstrate the, even the importance of the subject. So that's what we've got to push. Now, let me connect that to something else real quick. Um, this morning, uh, or last night, right before I went to bed, I tweeted something about Black Lives Matter. And uh, I, I think one of the positives is that at least for a lot of people, more information is becoming available about Black Lives Matter, the organization, and demonstration of what it's really all about. Because while our society has been moving rapidly into a expression of secular insanity there's still a lot of people in the united states that will buy that to a point and then there's still some connections to the past that make them go when it when it comes right down to punching the last hole and 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 making the last commitment to just a total obliteration of what the united states once was and so that information is, is coming out, and the plainly Marxist orientation, two of the three founding women, black women, of the organization, open to identify themselves as Marxist. And when you read their materials, not just that one website, but other websites as well, because it's, it's pretty much been founded in the digital age, and so it's not like... You can go back to a hundred year old printed documents or something like that. This is only in the past decade. Um, when you go to those materials, it is patently obvious and clear that this is a Marxist movement. It's a global movement. It's a revolutionary movement. And it is of definition affirmative of every kind of anti Christian sexual concept possible. And especially the concept of transgenderism. Homosexuality is just a, just a given. But transgenderism, central to the affirmations of the Black Lives Matter movement. That's why you saw, last weekend, these huge uh, gatherings of people uh, promoting uh, Black Trans Lives Matter. 
Now, I don't think most most Americans really get that. Um, I, I don't think most most Americans can really understand what that's all about. They have not thought about it deeply enough to realize this is just this is an extreme expression of rebellion against the created order that has given form and function to our society all along. This is this is one of the most obvious examples of what people are really up to. Um, I just don't think they get that, but it feel but right now it feels good. And, you know, right now the big thing is, you know, I was driving out of the parking lot after getting my food, and here's this big old sign in one of the store windows, Black Lives Matter, you know. And so that's what everybody's supposed to do. I mean, if you say Black Lives Matter and you get, oh, hey, high five, oh, oh. well, what are you saying? One of the things to keep in mind, we mentioned on the last program, and let me emphasize this here, is I had a guy on Twitter this morning say, well, I'm sure you, you mean the organization, not the statement, because that's a transparently true statement. The... Organization is is trafficking on switching back and forth, equivocating between the sentence Black Lives Matter and the organization Black Lives Matter. They're equivocating on that. So if you push back on the organization, they hit you with the sentence and call you a racist and everything else. Um if you dare say all lives matter, if you dare say Asian lives matter, if you dare say Hispanic lives matter, um, uh, uh, police officers' lives matter, firemen's lives matter, nurses' lives, whatever, none of those are, are, are allowable right now because of the assumed narrative that there is a genocide going on in only one group. That's the assumed narrative. There is a genocide going on in that one group, but it is being perpetrated by that group against that group. It's black males killing black males. If you want to call that a genocide, the numbers aren't really genocidal, but they are way, way, way too high. But the narrative is, no, it's white cops. It's white supremacy that's doing all of this. That's the narrative. It's a false narrative. It's, it's, it, it is repeated so often that people who believe it think that they're accepting just given facts, but it's just simply not true. But that's what is being presented. And so you look at that sentence, and then you see, you look at the organization, and there is such a, again, if you just sit back as a Christian, there is such a chasm between the sentence and the organization. I mean, we know that transgenderism destroys life. It does not, it does not build up life. The, the suicide rate amongst transgenders is sig significantly higher than, than other portions of the population. Um, you, you, you don't have the, you, you literally have a movement that is promoting the mutiliza mutilation of healthy bodies, the, the giving of, of uh, puberty blockers to eight-year-olds. I mean, this is destructive. It doesn't matter your, whether you're white, black, or anything else. It is absolutely destructive. And yet, it's at the heart of the movement Black Lives Matter. So, you have that aspect, and then you have the just the, the reality that the whole narrative that we're being hunted down and, and killed is simply, you are, by your own people, but you won't, won't deal with that part, so it's easier to blame somebody else. All of that stuff. But here's the real issue. Well, th this is one, just another issue. The sentence, Black Lives Matter. What does matter mean? I mean, let's... It's interesting. I, I saw one source today that said uh, that it was a Black Lives Matter source, the organization... And when it defined black, it said anyone who identifies as black. Well, I think we have the solution right there. Let's just all identify as black. We're all unified. We're done. Cool. No more rioting. Everything's good, right? Uh, yeah. yeah, I know. I know. I know. It doesn't work that way. But they, they have to say that because that's the, that's the lingo. It's, it's incoherent. 
That, that's why they can't have debate. They only have screaming uh, and violence. But anyway, what does... Okay, black lives matter. Each of these terms has to be defined. But what... The, the, but the, the assertion of the sentence is matters. Black lives matter. And it's functioning there verbally. It's the verbal element of the, um, of the sentence. Black lives matter, but it, it, it also has a sort of a substantival element to it. So what does that mean? And this is what I mean about thinking presuppositionally. That's what I would engage somebody. If, if somehow a conversation began, you know, I was sitting in a waiting room today, car was getting worked on, nothing wrong with it, just regular maintenance. And, and, uh, uh, no one, no one's really talking to anybody else. Um, but if a conversation had started, um, let's say it's a few weeks from now and now you've got to, you can't, you literally cannot go out in public. Uh, without masking up Arizona, which is really going to be great in August in, in Phoenix. That, that's good. What? Ice pack, yeah. You, know, you can't breathe through an ice pack. Um, and the conversation has started. Let's say someone saw my... The, the, let's say I actually get the one I ordered. Maybe somebody doesn't read what it says or misreads it or something. I don't know. I, I, get, I get my face mask. Um and somebody reads it, and we, we start this conversation. And they say black lives matter. Okay, what, is, what does matter mean? In their worldview, when you say something matters, upon what basis? You see, here is a situation where the, there is still the cultural capital that has been left over from our past that's built into our language. It's built into our use of language. Matter. We can say that something matters only in a worldview where there is purpose and meaning. The problem is, the guy that kicked open the door for all of this stuff, for homosexuality and transgenderism and, and massive racism, because he himself was a massive racist, was Charles Darwin. Darwin believed plainly that the black race was an inferior race um, due to genetics. Well, he didn't know genetics. Due to natural selection, which will then, in neo-Darwinism, become an issue of uh, genetic superiority uh, on the part of other elements of the human family. Anyway, we could not have any of this conversation if it were not for the theory of evolution and the Darwinian worldview that has, fl that has developed from it. And in that world, all you have to do is listen to Richard Dawkins. No lives matter. Life doesn't matter. This is a cruel, unfeeling, uncaring, random universe of energy transfer. Nothing more. There is no more meaning than energy transfer. All chemical reactions are energy transfers. And the final state of the universe, as it is expanding right now, is called heat death. Where all final, you know, a star is a concentration of energy that then gives its energy out. And that's how you can have life on a planet. So, but they're all dying. Over time, there will be fewer and fewer stars forming. So that at some point, and I've not seen the current speculation as to how far out this is, but at some point you have heat death where everything reaches the same temperature. 
There are no more focused places of energy. There can be no life, no organization. That's it. That's, that is the ultimate end of all things in Charles Darwin. Well, Charles Darwin had no idea of any of this stuff. He didn't know anything about genetics or anything like that. But that's certainly the end of Richard Dawkins' world. And so Black Lives Matter is a meaningless statement in a secular world. Black is just simply a descriptive of one set of genotype that isn't overly relevant. Lives, brief transient organizations of organic molecules that results in death and the redistribution of those organic molecules back into the system. Matter, nothing does. There's no transcendent meaning. There can't be. You are the accidental result of accidental processes. Life didn't have to start on this planet. It doesn't matter if it continues on this planet. Eventually, the sun becomes a, a, a red giant and engulfs Mercury, Venus, and Earth. Someday, the, the, from their perspective, given current trends in understanding the current usage of hydrogen being fused into helium in the core of the sun, you eventually run out of hydrogen. And then you start fusing helium into the next element, the next element, and this causes an expansion of the planet, because of the, of the sun, because the gravitational pull decreases, and so you've, you've got, right now it's being held together, by, but that starts to change, and it expands, and Earth gets gobbled up, and that's it. That's, that, that's all there is to it. You are literally stardust. And to stardust, you will return. So Black Lives Matter is an incoherent, meaningless statement. All, all you can do from the secular perspective is say, at this point in time, in the billions of years of history of this particular solar system, which is a part of one particular galaxy of 150 billion different galaxies, on one of the smallest of the planets in this solar system, life has accidentally evolved, evolved to such a state that at this point in time, in the current political organization of these random life forms, there is an emphasis upon a certain group of people who share certain, a certain phenotype, given their genotype, and that could change after the election, that could change 100 years from now, 100 years is a blink in the eye, a blink of the eye in cosmological terms. And it has absolutely, positively, no meaning to the solar system, the galaxy, or the universe at all. It's irrelevant. That's your secular worldview. That's... So, when someone says Black Lives Matter, that might be a good question to ask somebody. What does matter mean? And I'm not talking about a physical definition of atoms and molecules and protons and neutrons and electrons and anything like that. I'm not talking about the mysterious dark matter or any of that type of stuff. You're saying something. There's a, there's a verbal element in that sentence when you say black lives matter. Where, where do you get that from? And the problem is, since they've borrowed from our worldview and our language... We now have a hook. We have a connection. They used our language. They borrowed our worldview. They always have to. And you get somebody talking long enough, and eventually they will contradict themselves. They will, use, they will borrow from God to hold that mess of a worldview they, that they have together. And then you go, 
Gotcha. Because as soon as they say, yeah, Black Lives Matter, why? The only way to, to ground that is because they are created to matter by God. And once you have God in the picture, then we can finally bring all of this Marxist critical theory intersectionality madness into the light of what he has said is true. And what he has said is that stuff isn't. So there's a consideration of not only the fact that they're playing on they're playing on the fact that people in our society do not think critically. And so they'll use a sentence that good-hearted people want to affirm, Black Lives Matter. And then they equivocate to the Marxist worldview behind it, even though the very sentence itself, to be meaningful, has to repudiate the atheistic Marxism, critical theory, and everything else that gives life, gives life to the movement itself. That's what was so great about that video. You all saw it. Um, I couldn't find it right now if I tried to, but it was, it was all over Twitter yesterday. Of this uh, black fella who comes up on all these people of differing ethnicities, medical people outside a hospital. They've all got their scrubs on and they're doing some Black Lives Matter thing and they've all got their masks on and they're, you know, they're doing their social distancing. And because he's black, this one lady he actually comes out with a sign and kneels in front of him. Which I... Wow, is that creepy. Um, but... So he, he comes up... So, so do all Black Lives Matter? Yeah, all Black Lives Matter. Uh, how about... Um, uh, black lives that are killed by other blacks, they matter? And a few people are like, well, yeah, yeah. How about all those black lives killed in the abortuary? Silence. They're looking at each other, They're looking at each other going, did he say that? And then he goes, yeah, I thought so. Thought so. It, it, was, it was incredible because it exposed not only the incoherence and hypocrisy of the movement, but the incoherence and the, and the hypocrisy of the people who have been sucked into it. Who know in their, when, when they're actually forced to think and to stop just going with the emotional flow, that what they're saying really doesn't make any sense. And they know deep down inside that Asian lives matter. And they know deep down inside that Hispanic lives matter. And they know deep down inside that they could go to places in the world where those are the people suffering, not the blacks. But that doesn't help right now. That doesn't help to do whatever it is they've decided they're going to do, which a lot of them are just simply told that it was a good thing to do by their professors in university. And so it's just sort of like, well, okay. And unfortunately, most of them at home had never been given a meaningful understanding of why the United States was founded and why it's done what it's done in the past and its imperfections and yet the vital difference between a nation that affirms that our rights come from God versus a nation that affirms that our privileges are granted by a government. As long as this nation understood that, it remains strong. It no longer understands that, and therefore it is being subjugated literally in a matter of days. In a matter of days. Um, global historians in the future will point to this time period with awe. It was... It was the time when the bloated corpse finally exploded. The death had taken place long before that, but all of a sudden, 
Or you might, I don't know if you saw this, I follow a, uh, what is that, uh, Nature is Scary on Twitter. Do you follow Nature is Scary? Yeah, I've, 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 um, <laughs> Nature is Scary. There it is. Nature is Scary. It's just Nature is Scary. It's at Nature is Scary. And there is stuff that is just, but here, <laughs> <laughs> Do I dare drag this over here? Um, yeah, you yeah did, did you see that? Yeah. Well, you're not gonna put it up. Put yeah, yeah. Go ahead. I'm not gonna tell. I'm not gonna tell you what I said. Okay. <laughs> but the 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 caption on this is how is this bug even alive? Because. The vast majority of its innards are gone. It's just a shell. But it's still it's still walking on along. I mean, give that give that give that boy some credit. I wouldn't be doing too well um, if I had lost uh, about two thirds of my innards. Uh, he ain't gonna be around for long, obviously. But wow, uh, congratulations to him. Well, that's what happens to a nation that was founded on the basis of the Judeo-Christian worldview, and then decides, I'm not going to believe any of that stuff anymore. We've been gutted. And we're still walking along, but you can't walk along forever unless something major happens, like national repentance, um, a massive outpouring of the Spirit of God, and the vast expanse uh, an advancement of the gospel. Uh, that would do it. That would be an awesome thing. If you're not praying for that, you need to. The sad thing is there are a lot of people in the church today that would think that would be a terrible thing. They think that's what's happening right now as we move toward a secular system that will eventually, if, 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 if it's not stopped, the totalitarianism, which we're already seeing, if you dare. Can you imagine for a second if I worked for a major corporation and did this on the side? Not possible, is it? Not anymore. Not anymore. If it became known that I worked for a major corporation, um... Can, can you imagine how fast I would be fired for daring to say 10% of the things I say, let alone everything that I say? We're already there. The totalitarian mindset is all around us. Absolutely all around us. Let me give you one more before I switch subjects. Um, I saw this one yesterday. Sean Patrick Maloney is a representative from the state of New York. He is a homosexual. Uh, not, people don't even mention that anymore. It's just sort of like, well, you know, doesn't matter. Biblically, it matters. Biblically, it matters. We're talking about a category of behavior and in his case, self-identification, that is specifically noted in Scripture as an example of the effect of sin upon man. And he is in the government. And we're not allowed to go, that might, imp that might sort of impact how he votes on things, you think? Right. And so he's commenting on the Bostock debacle um, from Neil Gorsuch. And he says, and we know, now he, what he's saying is Gorsuch and Roberts, um, Roberts especially, tends to, this is sort of a description of the way John Paul II was. I don't know if any of you, a lot of the folks in the audience maybe knew the program or weren't listening 20 years ago. Uh, but 
when John Paul II was pope, th this cycle sort of developed, where one year you'd get him saying something really weirdly liberal, and then the next year there'd be an encyclical that is like the Council of Trent. And then the next year, something oddly liberal. And then the next year, the Council of Trent's back. So it was throw a bone this way, throw a bone that way. throw. And you understand why. I, I mean, Roman Catholicism as an organism, um, if it was a bug, it would have this huge lobe on the left and then a smaller lobe on the right but that's made out of like armor stuff. And then there's this little, little bitty connection part <laughs> that, that holds the two together. And that's where the Pope is. And he's trying to hold this stuff together. And that's sort of, yeah. Um, and so what this Maloney is saying is that what the Chief Justice does is he'll pair things. And so he'll give the, he just gave the liberals one. He is getting, well, and I, I'm, I, I try not to do this, but everybody else does it, and I keep falling back in. They're not liberals. They're leftists. Liberals are for freedom. Leftists are not. These are not leftists, okay? These are not liberals. They're leftists. So he's thrown the leftist one out. So Maloney is saying, look out, because Gorsuch is big on religious liberty, and Roberts is going to want to throw a bone to the conservatives. So look out. They may have just given with one hand and they'll take with another. And in his so doing so, he said, quote, and we know that Neil Gorsuch is a supporter of so-called religious liberty, which is a bogus term, a pretext for discrimination hiding behind the guise of religion. Quote, unquote. I watched the videos. It was, of course, on MSNBC. So here you have one of the enumerated foundational rights of the Constitution of the United States. Freedom of religious expression. Freedom of religious belief. And for one of the 430-some-odd members of the House of Representatives, that is a so-called religious liberty, which is a bogus term. A bogus term. The totalitarians find their final justification in vindication when everyone bows the knee, literally, to their ultimate big brother, their ultimate authority. And a lot of us on the right, that's not what we want. If you want to reject that God exists, you're going to find out eventually. I'm going to do my best to warn you, but no skin off my back. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm going to try to tell you the truth, but the fact of the matter is I can't change your heart. That's not that you're going to, you're going to stand before God someday. And God's going to judge. That's what Scripture says. But from their perspective, there is no someday. That final bowing of the knee has to happen now, in this life. And then, as in 1984, once you bow the knee, then your, your worth is done, and Big Brother can dispose of you. But he can't just kill you. Because then you would die as one who is standing as a rebel. And that's a refutation of their ultimate authority. That's an overthrow of their worldview. So they've got to break you first. And then once you do what politicians, police captains, everybody else has been doing all across our land, you bow the knee, you lay down face first in the ground, whatever. Um... Then they're done with you. you. You don't have any meaning to them anymore. There's no redemption for you. There's no forgiveness. You're just now to be sloughed off in whatever way you do that type of thing. So, so there you go. Uh, okay. 
Oh, this is interesting. Ooh, look at that. Sorry. I don't know. Uh, can, you, can you see this? This just popped up. Let me, let me get a little bit bigger. 4,000 comments. Sun watching spacecraft's discoveries keep piling up. Space.com, which is really neat. But I, I saw a, um article last week that one of our solar observatory uh, spacecraft was going to do one of its closest passes. And uh, this is a little video. Uh, it's not as big as it gets, really. Well, oh, just killed it. Well, see, you messed me up. You're you're the one trying. To, you're the one trying. You're, you're one saying you gotta do this. And you're you're supposed to be good at this. You're supposed to be able to just grab this stuff and 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 make it go. You've got all the time in the world to practice this stuff, but. Yeah, so there's no expand expand a wanda thing here. You know, that's that's just that's just all there is to it. But this is uh, this is a really cool little video that you may or may not get to see. I don't know. It really is not up to me. All, all I know is if you know I sat behind that glass window, I would have had this stuff down a long time ago. That's all I can say. That's just you know just just pointing it out. Um, but uh, evidently, uh, it is uh, counting up the number of comments. I guess there's a whole lot more comments than we have seen. Because a lot of them you don't get to see until they actually enter into the, the uh, aurora photosphere of the sun and stuff like that. And then that's it for them. <laughs> it's like, da, 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 uh, and it's all over. So, so I guess we're not going to be able to show it to you. So. Oh, thank you. Yeah, so here's... Uh, the uh, number three, there's number 4,000, there's number three, 3999. And uh, you wonder how many there have been since creation. Uh, there was nobody out there to watch. Uh, maybe the angels were watching. I'm not sure if they find that fascinating or not. But, but now we've got these uh, boogers out there that uh, are watching all this stuff. And uh, that's a pretty cool thing. Very cool thing. I, um, like I said, that happened to just pop up on uh, the Twitter feed uh, as I was closing something else. And uh, I just think it's, I just think it's really awesome that we have these things out there in God's creation, seeing these things that no one's ever seen before. You know, um, I've told you, I've got a picture in my room of uh, uh, the Huygens lander uh, landing on Titan, uh, circling Saturn. I just think that's just awesome. Um, I think solar physics is incredible. Um, great stuff. Great stuff. Anyway. All right. Completely shifting gears, if you don't mind. Um, let's see if we can bring that back up. Good. Yay. <laughs> I keep trying to, to, to hit the expander thingy because you want things all big and it ends up closing the thing. All right. This is um, this is a website that if you have interest in uh, studying Islam, reaching out to your Muslim neighbors, one of the best websites to be aware of. Very important. There are a lot of good websites actually, um, but this is the Corpus Chronicum project, corpus.quran.com. And as you can see along the left-hand side, there are a number of, there's a Quran dictionary, word by word, Quran dictionary, English translation, syntactic tree bank, ontology of concepts, documentation, Quranic grammar, et cetera, et cetera. This is, um, there is, there is not a single go-to program for the Quran as yet. There, there had been one years ago called Alam 6.0. It doesn't even work on any of my computers anymore. But when I first started studying Islam in 2005, 2006, um, that was that was a good good program to have. Um, interestingly enough, apps. I have an iPhone, iPad app uh, called My Quran, 
Which is the best I've found as far as um, concordancing, Arabic, um, you know, just looking stuff up. It's, it's, it's good. Still nothing like accordance or um, logos or olive tree or any of those things. It, that, that just doesn't exist yet. But the um, Corpus Chronicum project at least gives you, gets you something. Uh, and it's uh, it's extremely useful. I forget how I jumped onto this. I, I forget what caught my attention along these lines. But I was looking at a particular, well, this particular ayah from the Quran. The Corpus Chronicum will give you multiple let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven translations uh, all in one page, which is very useful. This is uh, Surah Yunus. This is Surah 10 in the Quran. And the Sahih International, which is a, it's a Salafi, um, very conservative, primarily literal, but not always. Sometimes all of a sudden it just goes... Jumps right off the cliff uh, when it's something that would be relevant to defending the theological perspective of its translators. There's a lot of that, actually, in Yusuf Ali and some of the others. Uh, you, can, you can pretty much tell where they're coming from. They're willing to translate according to tradition a lot of times. But Sahih International is pretty good. And you'll notice it says, They have said, Allah has taken a son, exalted is he, he is the one free of need. To him belongs whatever is in the heavens and whatever is in the earth. You have no authority for this claim. Do you say about Allah that which you do not know? Um, now, notice uh, that um, Yusuf Ali, which is the third translation down, has a different way of putting it. It says, they say, Allah hath begotten a son. Glory be to him, he is self-sufficient. His are all things in the heavens and on earth. No warrant have ye for this. Say you about all of what ye know not. So, I don't remember now why I started looking at the grammar. I was saddened, to be honest with you, when I started looking at this. My Arabic's almost gone. It's just terrible. I was putting so much time into it between 2006 and 2009 or so, and meeting with my tutor, he would be so disappointed in me. Um, but if you don't use it, you lose it. There's just no two ways about it. Uh, I mean, the grammar is still there, but ugh, it's, it's terrible. But I started digging into it, and I wanted to look at the verb, Allah has taken. Because what does that mean? Allah has taken a son. So Pictal also has Allah hath taken, and then in parentheses, unto him a son. Shakir says Allah has taken a son to himself. Uh, Muhammad Sarwar really goes out there. Some people, this is like, this must be like the New Living Translation for the, for the Quran. Some people have said that God has begotten a son. God is too glorious to have a son. God is self-sufficient. To him belongs all that is in the heavens and the earth. In this, you people have no authority. Do you ascribe to God things which you have no knowledge, of which you have no knowledge? Uh, Mohsen Khan says, they, Jews, Christians, and pagans, say, Allah has begotten a son, children. Glory be to him. He is rich, free of all wants. Hey, look, Rich. He is rich, and it's capitalized. I, who knew? <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, and Arbery has, God has taken to him a son. So the what I was looking at was the specific um, word uh, to take. And so you can go to the word by word portion, which is, this is where it really is very, very useful. Because, for example, uh, here, ha here is, has taken, uh, Allah has taken, third person masculine singular form, 
uh, form eight, a perfect verb. Um, and you can then create a concordance out of this and see uh, what other places this, this appears in. So you can go to concordance, and here's all the other places. Oh, go away, Google Translate. Uh, all the other places where this is, ta this is found. And you'll notice, as I'm looking at this, it's take, 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 take. Take and take and take and take all the way, all the way down until you get to where we are, Allah has taken. And so I was like, I wonder if that's the same term used elsewhere in the Quran, in some of the texts that are relevant at this particular point. And so I started looking through and I got down to 18 and here's Allah has taken. And so you click on that and it's from Surat Al-Kaf, the cave. And you have the word here, and here's the Sahih International, and, and to warn those who say, Allah has taken a son. It's the exact same idea of Allah taking a son. It's like, well, that's interesting. So I go back to, stop offering that. I've got to find a way to turn that off. Uh, so I go back, and I scroll on down a little bit more, and I don't see um, until I think right here. I think it's like seventy-two three is the next next place that I find it. Um, twenty-three ninety-one has it. Yeah, right here. Twenty-three ninety-one. I'm sorry. 2391, uh, Allah has not taken any son, nor has there ever been with him any deity. If there had been, then each deity would have taken what it created, and some of them would have sought to overcome others. Exalt is Allah above what they describe concerning him. So I found a number of places, Surah 72.3, uh, 18.4, 1935, 2391, this idea of Allah taking a son. Now, why would I be chasing Arabic verb forms through the Quran? Well, this is one of the key areas of conversation between ourselves and our Muslim friends. And given that the Quran functions as the ultimate authority in the Muslim mind, then what, what does the Quran mean? And has later Muslim orthodoxy expanded on, maybe even changed, what the Quran is actually communicating? Uh, I think you find a lot of places where that's the case. Allah has not taken any son, nor has there ever been with him any deity. If there had been, then each deity would have taken what it created, and some of them would have sought to overcome others, exalted as a law above what they describe concerning him. Now, let's, let's have a little test for those of you who are longtime listeners to the program. No, I'm not going to open up the phones and give away the last. We do still have one uh, CD set of the Forgotten Trinity. We, not, we need to... Need to Come up with a... You finally did send that other guy his, right? Because it was... He was probably starting to wonder if we had... Ever going to get around to doing that, you know? But but he got it. Okay, good. How many times did he have to call? No, never mind. Um, so here's, here's the quiz. When the Quran says, Do not say three... What is always the next assertion in the text of the Quran after it says, do not say three? We've gone over this a bunch of times before. You're not Googling this, are you? Okay, good. <laughs> yes, he's Googling it. <laughs> 
I can tell when you open a browser because it's 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 bright. It's brighter than whatever you have over there normally. So you get all this extra light up on you. That's what's that's what's going on. What's the next thing? I mean, this is the, I I every single time I speak about Islam and what the Quran says about what Christians believe. This is something I emphasize. Every time the Quran says do not say three, the very next line is, there is only one God, Allah. The point being, if I, emphasize, if I say to you, do not say three, and then my next word is, there is only one blank. Whatever you fill in there is what I was saying there's not three of. So, if, if you're a big Yankees fan, you say, do not say that there are the three greatest baseball teams. There is only one great baseball team, the Yankees. Now, in the mind of the author of the Quran, to say three is to say three gods. Because it says, when he says, do not say the three, there is only one God, then the mind of the author of the Quran, there can be, he has no understanding of what the Trinity actually is. The Trinity is a tritheistic formulation in his mindset. Very clearly. Very clearly. And that comes out here too. Allah has not taken any son nor has there ever been with him any deity. So, unless these are two different statements, the idea is that a son would be a separate deity. And in fact, it seems like a, com a competing deity. Because it says, if there had been, then each deity would have taken what it created and some of them would have sought to overcome others. There would have been some type of disharmony, some type of battle going on. Exalted is Allah above what they describe concerning him. So this is a Unitarian monotheist who has no concept of Trinitarianism at all, arguing against minimally Unitarian henotheism, and I say Unitarian henotheism in the context of any deity is finite and therefore can only represent, be represented by one person. Similar to the pantheons of gods uh, amongst the Canaanites, Amorites, Babylonians, etc. That's what this is. That's, that's what... Sir, 2391 is, is talking about. So what does it mean to take a son? Allah has not taken any son. They say Allah has taken a son. He is exalted above this. Elsewhere, when it says Allah has a son, how can he have a son if he does not have a consort, a wife, a sexual partner? Um, that's what, Surah 661, something like that. Anyway, uh, it starts, has a six in it. Um, no, no, you don't need to. That's all right. Uh, I could pull it up fast enough if I need to. The, the point is that when we talked a little bit about the Quran a few days ago and the statements being made by Muslim scholars recognizing that the Quran has a textual history, and that the mere dismissal of the New Testament based upon the fact that we as Christians recognize the textual history of both the Old and New Testaments, even though the vast majority of Muslims do not recognize the textual history of their own text. If we can get the other side to realize they have to do textual criticism as well, then we can lay aside what is normally used to get around this and say, okay, now that we're dealing with our texts on the same grounds, then let's do the next thing that needs to be done. And that is 
when New Testament scholars deal with the intertextuality of the New Testament and the Old Testament. That is, our text quotes from the Old Testament all the time. We have, since the beginning, dealt with, well, what, what version was being rendered, the Greek Septuagint, almost always. What does that have to do with the Hebrew? Why would it have been that way? What about divergent readings between the Hebrew Masoretic text and the Greek Septuagint and issues such as that? We're dealing with intertextuality, and it's a challenging area. I mean, you've seen that Beale Carson edited behemoth of a book talking about the New Testament's use of Old Testament quotations. It's massive. So lots and lots and lots of work gone in that area. Well, here's the issue. If you're a Muslim, you have to deal with intertextuality too. Because even though there's almost no meaningful direct quotation from a written source on the part of the Quran, and you would say, of course not, because Muhammad is passing this on orally. Well, the only problem with that is the Quran says that the Torah was sent down, the Injil was sent down, and the Quran is sent down. So Allah knows what's in each one. And it's plain that many of the stories, for example, Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah, are based on what is found in Genesis 18 and 19. There's no question about that. So why do they each take different forms? Why are there differences between what God says or Lot says or actions that were taken or things like that? There are differences each time it is presented. But the point is, you are stuck with intertextuality. Your own text makes reference to the Torah and Injil and tells their respective communities that they are to judge by what is found in the Torah and Injil. And so any scholarly study, any in-depth study of the Quran is going to have to deal with what sources it used. Now, theologically, there are certain Muslims that say it used no sources at all. It's eternally been written on the heavenly book. There's, there's no sources to look at. The problem is, as soon as you start looking at manuscripts and doing the textual critical work that is necessary on the Quran, you can't avoid asking the question, what was the context in which these manuscripts were produced? And hand in hand with that is, huh, okay, I'm looking at the section of the Quran where Jesus forms clay birds and then breathes on them and they fly away. Now, what is a serious scholar, and to use Dr. Cotty's words, Western scholar, what is a serious, even believing Muslim, but Western scholar going to do when you realize that this story is found in sources before the Quran? Well, the Western scholar, now, to be honest with you, a lot of scholars in the East aren't going to care and aren't going to do anything about it at all. But a Western scholar has been trained, I need to take a look at that source. And you take a look at that source and you go, huh, it sort of looks like one's dependent upon the other. Looks like there's verbal parallels. And so you're going to, you know, when I, when I wrote uh, whatever Christian needs to know about the Quran, and I was dealing with this particular text, I tracked down the original source in the original language and translated it for the book. And that way you can look at sources and evaluate those sources, right? 
Well, that's what the Muslim has to do. And that automatically raises the question, yeah, but uh, this is clearly not canonical material. It, it doesn't come from the first century. And, and in fact, the Quran says that the Injil was given to Jesus. This came hundreds and hundreds of years after that. So is this something outside the Injil? And yet it's considered to be authoritative. It's found in the Quran. So as this starts raising all of these questions, which is where the real conversation needs to be going. And the standardized answer, which is, well, we don't really have the Torah anymore. It's been lost. Or that's only in reference to what we technically identify as Torah today, which is be Pentateuch, and ignores the Nevi'im and Ketuvim, the laws, the, the um, prophets and writings. That's a standard response. I would suggest to you that's extremely anachronistic. It's making assumptions about what the author of the Quran knew that you don't have any evidence that he actually knew those things. And especially when you talk about the gospel, when, when, a, when a modern Muslim says to me, yeah, well, you know, th th it's not what you've got in the New Testament. Uh, the New Testament, no, that can't be it because you've got four gospels. There's only supposed to be one gospel. Well, that's one gospel. Just because you have four books that tell the one gospel doesn't mean you have four different gospels in the sense of four different messages. And the early church used the term gospel to refer to the entirety of the Christian message. And you're talking about someone who only has marginal exposure to Orthodox Christian faith, Muhammad, using certain terminology. Now, the Salafi, the conservative, says none of this is Muhammad's terminology anyway. If you, if you stay at that point, you're not going to be able to answer most of the questions are going to be asked about, okay, you say that there's, there's not a fingerprint of man. This is just simply dictated by God. So why does God change the story when he tells the story of Lot? Why does he use sources that are not what he said they were? And what eventually people start going, well, okay, yeah, that, that would have been Muhammad's understanding. And then you have to start trying to come up with how that fits with some idea of, of Natsal being sent down, of, uh, of inspiration, revelation. And that's where you start getting into perspectives that already exist in Islam in the West, in what would be called liberal Islam. But now you're, you're really getting into areas of tremendous controversy that the conservatives just don't even want to talk about. They don't even, don't even want to go there. Lots of important issues, and they're all related to one another. They're all related to one another. And that's why I started chasing uh, this particular verb uh, through the Quran, because I, I want to be able, when I say the author of the Quran understood Jesus to to be this in Christian thought. I want to have looked at all the sources that I can look at that are going to be representational of a meaningful and sound Islamic answer. Because when I look at the Quran, I don't see any evidence that the author of the Quran understood what is actually contained in the pages of this New Testament. I, I I just don't. I don't see it. Um, but I want to try to find out. And so I want to be one of the ones that are chasing, I'm chasing verbal forms through the Quran in Arabic rather than just going, bah, guy didn't know what he was talking about. I, I want to know what, what does it mean to take a son? And especially in Surah 2399, what 2391, 
it, when it says, a law has not taken any son, nor has there ever been with him any deity. Is that conjunctive or disjunctive? In other words, is the second part of the sentence meant to be descriptive of or expansive of the first, or are they meant to be two different concepts completely? That would require me to think that... And I'm literally thinking this through right now to try to express it in a proper way. That would require me to think that the author of the Quran somehow had a deeper level of knowledge of what the relationship of sonship was if he's talking about Christianity. If he's not talking about Christianity, that's another issue, is there have been many interpreters, especially in the West, who have said, this, this doesn't have anything to do with Christianity. This is the 360 idols in the Kaaba, uh, many of which were father, mother, child, triads, um, that's certainly, certainly, I've, I've read even Western scholars trying to come up with weird, wild ways around Surah 5116. Let, let me pop that up here real quick, um, because Surah 5116, just, if you're not familiar with it, most people are who've watched this program, but just really quickly, uh, Surah 5116, uh, here it is. And remember when the disciples said, Oh, Jesus, the son of Mary, oh, that's 5112. Why did you go to 1112? Um, da -dum, da -dee, da -dee, da -dee, da -dee. English translation. Uh, yeah, it went to 112. I clicked on 116. I might have clicked on something. Anyway, and beware the day when Allah will say, Oh, Jesus, son of Mary, did you say to the people, take me and my mother as deities besides Allah? He will say, exalt are you. It was not for me to say that to which I have no right. If I had said it, you would have known it. You know what is within myself, and I do not know what is within yourself. Indeed, it is you who is knower of the unseen." I have read what I consider to be next to outlandish interpretations from Western scholars, non-Muslim Western scholars, trying to find some way of rescuing the author from such a blatant misunderstanding of what Christian theology was at the time of the writing of the Quran. Because, I mean, they being non-Muslims don't have the option of saying, well, this is divine revelation and you know, things like that. They're interpreting the Quran as a historical document in a particular context. And so they want to try to protect Muhammad from having just blundered in his understanding of what Christian theology is, but I don't see any way around it. Um, beware of the day when Allah will say, Oh, Jesus, son of Mary, did you say to the... So this is God speaking. This is God speaking, addressing Jesus, the son of Mary. Did you say to the people, take me and my mother as deities besides Allah? So this is Surah 5, Surah Tamida, Surah 5, contain, Surah 4 and 5 contain... I think all but one or two of the places where it says, do not say three. Maybe all of them, now I think about it. Do not say three. It's right, right here. So here's your three. Take me and my mother as deities besides Allah. The only place I can find a three anywhere in the Quran. And the description is as deities besides Allah. Now, Let me see, let me see here. Um, is that yeah? I'm not sure. Bacon. Okay, so that's Minduni. Minduni besides from Allah. Minduni. I wonder. Let me click on that. 
and then go to concordance. And I am a wondering myself here. Nope, doesn't show it at, at 23, 2391. Uh, they might have min, but I'd have to pop up 2391. In 2391, and this is the only thing about the Corpus Chronicum, it's, it's not all that fast to get from one thing to another. Uh, but I want to see 2391 real quick here. Um, when it says, and there is not Kana Mahu with him any gods. Um, so you have other deities, and it's Ilahin, Ilahin, uh, plural form. Um, the same idea, anyways, of deities besides Allah. Sons don't, he don't take to himself a son. They're not other deities besides Allah. Surah 5116, did you say take me and my mother as deities besides Allah? The constant emphasis in the Quran on Unitarian monotheism, though that's not really the, the issue at that time, it's just monotheism, monotheism, it becomes Unitarian monotheism later on. That is part of of the constant narrative, the consistent narrative. You're trying to find consistent narratives in the Quran because it's coming from different parts of Muhammad's life. And one consistent element is this type of polemic against polytheism. But is it a polemic against the polytheism of the Kaaba? And was that just simply assumed to be relevant in application to Christianity? Because I've had many Muslims say, say you're, you're still a polytheist. You're still a polytheist. That is, that is a part of what many of them say. And they get that from the Quran. Where do you find the evidence anywhere that the author of the Quran really had an understanding of what's actually in the New Testament? That is why you chase verbs through the Quran. All right. Well, uh, it was actually enjoyable for a few moments anyways um, to uh, chase something other than uh, critical race theory and uh, things like that and actually be thinking in the context of witnessing and stuff like that back the you know back in the old days you know January uh, it's sort of, sort of it's, I sort of feel like a decade has passed since uh, January. Yeah, thank you very much. Would you get that out of your ear? I just wish you people could see some of the things I have to, I have to put up with in here. It's, it's, it's tough. It You're playing it by ear? Yeah, we are playing it by ear tomorrow, literally. Um, uh, all depends on stuff. I'll be honest with you right now, it's not looking good, but we'll let you know one way or the other whether we're going to be able to do something tomorrow or not. Um, and then, like I said, next week, don't know, but I do have, you know, I, I feel badly, you know, Seb gets me this beautiful music and we've not used it yet. So, uh, I want to, I want to try to do that. And I don't know how many months ago it was, I asked for a green screen background, but you know, um, that would have been nice to have had too, but, uh, you know. why don't, why don't you buy one from the United States? You, uh, we, we know people who can help with this. That would be the way to do it. Yes, yes. Anyway. All right, folks. Thanks for listening to the program today. We may be here tomorrow, may not. We'll see next time. God bless.